All right. Uh, as introduced, we are Emma and Rebecca from Mighty Kingdom, and we will be telling you all about data-driven narratives today. Uh, before we do that, we'd like to do a uh, welcome to country acknowledgement of country, so go ahead. Um, we would like to acknowledge the Ghana people, who are the traditional custodians of the land that we make our games on. We acknowledge their continued spiritual connection to the land and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Perfect. So we've already been introduced. Um, so we're going to talk about a number of things and at the end we'll have our socials up too. So if you have any questions or if we don't have time for questions at the end, you're welcome to contact us on any of these platforms. <laughs> <laughs> what is data driven narrative all about? Oh, I think it's been a bit spooky. Do you want to oh, it's spooky. jump out of presenter mode and jump back in? Otherwise we can just go through the notes if it doesn't work properly. Yes. Hmm. Very strange. There we go. There we there go. We go. <laughs> yeah. What is data driven <laughs> all about? Um, for some reason, some things didn't show up. Um, so this is about sort of data informed narratives, um, of processes, the processes that we've sort of come to use to um, inform our narratives. So um, using the results of the data that we collect, or sometimes the data that we have already to justify narrative decisions that align with the product, um, utilizing data from um, existing media and IPs to create thematically consistent and narrative story beats and frameworks. So um, a lot of paid work in the industry is work for hire. So um, there are often sort of some existing IPs, but often like if you're joining a, a product that already has some existing product, even if it's your own IP, um, these are really good practices to keep things really thematic and consistent. Um, it also can really help us to increase retention, especially in narrative, heavy and narrative focused games, um, because there is the, like the level and the gameplay side of it, but there's also narrative as well. Mm -hmm. um, and this can really help us with justifying um, choices to clients and colleagues. So. If your manager wants something, you can really easily show them this data and go, this is how I'm doing it. This is how I'm going to improve it. And it's then you see the results later on. So much easier to convince someone if you've got some yeah. data matching. <laughs> All right. So what are we talking about? <laughs> increasing prevalence of the increasing prevalence of transmedia and like big um space IPs. Yeah, big IPs. Um big franchises like Pokemon um, and Dragon, Dragon Ball Z, keeping up with the Kardashians, Marvel, <laughs> Shotkins is our thing. It's not just ours, it's Moose as well, but mm -hmm. we work with them. D&D &D is a big example yep. of this. The KFC games, Macca's oh, Monopoly. Gosh. I all love you, Yeah, yeah, it's so, it's, so good. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, so um, we'll also be talking about distilling story beats and themes. Um, third-party media and IPs to create um, thematically consisting, consistent narrative story beats, themes and frameworks, as mentioned before. Um, and it is still useful in your own IP, but it is also really useful um, just in general. Mm. <laughs> so we'll have a look at quantitative and qualitative data, um, which we've sort of combined, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it's a lot of our own impressions, but Mm -hmm. We also don't have, and I think a lot of people don't have the capacity to go and collect big quantities of data from. No, we don't. Yeah, um, unless it's directly from your games, which is good if you have a huge player base. Um, making data user friendly because um, there's a lot of data out there in the world that I find fascinating, but then I go and <laughs> look at it, and I want to um, stick my head in a bucket full of sand Absolutely. and never look at it again. And um, there's absolutely no way your manager is going to look at all of the data you send yeah. them if it's not at least a little bit clear what's going on. Yeah, and I'm I'm a designer um, and do a bit of product management as well. So I'm used to looking at these big sheets full of data mm -hmm. um, that looks a little bit maddening at times, but um, not everyone is. If you are showing this to artists or narrative designers or other people who mm -hmm. don't have the time to look at all of this, understand it, and frankly, probably don't want to, um, <laughs> make it colorful. Graphs are good. Think about doing like a um, contrast um, sort of essay um, or yeah, of writing about the patterns um, you find. But yeah. Even just color code what you're writing yeah. in like big blocks of text. So yeah, like, but say, we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll go through it. I, 
the color coding has changed my life, honestly. Oh, so good. Um, <laughs> so measuring data in live products as well, which we'll talk about at the end. Um, and mm. that's like with the purpose of improving narrative experience uh, for existing players, of course, and increasing retention, which we were able to do on one of our own products, Wildlife, which is the game in this picture. That's the it's pretty art. cute. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the very first game I worked on at Mighty Kingdom. Um, yeah, okay. All right. TV shows, <laughs> movies, and games. Oh my. So many things. Yeah. Um, so basically, I mean, I suppose we're talking about transmedia here. So it's like anything, it's translating um, different types of media um, so that you get useful data across. Uh, your different types of platforms. So when you're translating, um, the way I think about it is like if you're looking at a TV show, there'll be arcs throughout the episodes and the arcs throughout the season and even throughout seasons as well. So if you're um, consuming like a large portion of that media, um, mm. do something kind of really basic and measure it as you go. So I look for the themes um, per scene mm. and I look for the tension per scene as well. So um, I will usually create a Likert scale of three, really. So um, disagree that there's tension, agree that there's tension, and strongly agree that there's tension. Um, and strongly agree would be like everything's going wrong. Agree would be like there's something there and disagree is no. So it's mm -hmm. like a lower point in the tension, which is really important when it comes to um, pacing and beats and, and retention as well um, and for things to feel really natural. Um, first impressions, fresh impressions, um, do it as you go. So pause, watch something, pause, and then record it. Um, your first fresh impression is the best. It is uh, like it will, to an extent, depend on the person who's watching this. But um, Rebecca and I found that our data was like very, very comparable, surprisingly it was, comparable. It was actually a little bit scary. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> we found a system, we found a system that worked um, and that's what we're sort of trying to show you today. Um, keep open interpretations to, down to an absolute minimum if you can. Um, so TV shows, um, we swapped episodes at random, yes. which I think really helped with the consistency as well. And then we were able to sort of compare as well because there were a couple mm -hmm. where we started to do the same one <laughs> um, but that's okay and then we were like oh we wrote down the same yeah, things anyway exactly. so it's this is same. a good sign <laughs> yeah yeah um so yeah charts documentation uh, documents graphs and, and numbers you can easily point to and that don't require someone to sit through and interpret it all on their own will be really helpful to you mm -hmm. So beats, right. themes, and frameworks. So these are the, I guess, like they're the like the pillars, the game design <laughs> pillars, but of like any other media. Um, so we have, I mean, if you are having trouble finding the themes, maybe watch the entire series or do some research online or something like that, depending on what exactly you are researching and looking into. Um, but they're like the dominant things Thanks. that keep reoccurring so that they come up consistently um and if you see something that's sort of recurring throughout an episode that might not be a theme of the whole theory the series but you might um be able to sort of whittle it down and it might point you in the direction of the right of the um theme that you're looking for so Absolutely. we try to keep it to three main themes of course if there's a really good reason for you to have more than that or even less than that then um mm -hmm. go for it uh but that's what we've found works for us um Absolutely. so what is the overall feel that will help you um think about the tensions so is this mm -hmm. something is this like what the genre might indicate that as well but like also a, a romantic comedy would have like uh relationships as a theme yeah. and it might be um conflict as a tension um just for an example yeah and it might not it, um it's like relative tension so it might not have um like a, a sign uh sorry a scene where everyone is physically fighting the same way that maybe a horror genre mm -hmm. might or an action genre <laughs> um but so the tensions are relative it's the highest that you find in the series and it's the lowest point that you find in the mm -hmm. series but um 
try to break that into three um, of it is there, it isn't there, and it's very much there uh, because that will really help you with consistency. Um, and yeah, so what is repeated, what is reused um, throughout the episode or season that will bring you to your scenes, as we said, and um, what is repeated through the narrative as a whole. And if you keep these things in mind, you'll be able to find them, but I think it's pretty pretty yeah it's pretty easy it's pretty easy. Stuff online as well often with um existing ips and if it's your own ip these are still things that are really useful to keep in mind to keep your mm. story going and your um long-term players invested as well and like i will say like just having a better understanding of the themes that we'll have for our own um product was really really useful for me because i've currently been writing a lot of dialogue and being able to understand what the themes are and how those uh, like specific characters interact with those themes is mm. very, very useful. And the data that we ended up collecting for the game that we can't talk about, unfortunately, <laughs> um, we were looking at our data and we accidentally found all of this information out. Mm. We were able to cross-reference um, the tensions with the characters that were in each te yeah. um, theme because we recorded for the main characters who was in what scene as well underneath everything else, um, which we'll show you in a little bit. Um, and we were able to have a pretty good idea even without, yeah, yeah, like knowing much about the series as a whole, um, what these characters' personalities were like, um, due mm -hmm. to like how tense the scene was when they were in them. <laughs> All right. It's pretty good. Yeah. All right. It is a numbers game. Um, my notes keep disappearing for this one, but there, there we go. Um, so first impressions, fresh impressions, as um, we mentioned before, like at scale of three is mm -hmm. really, really good to keep things really consistent. I know it might be Absolutely. tempting to go more detail, but the more detail you have, the less consistent it will be across like different people. And if you're um, sharing this research with a lot of different people, um, it's best to keep it really mm. consistent. Even if you think you're going to be the only person doing it, there might be a point where you have to step away at some point in the future. So I do really encourage you to stick to just those three. Yeah. Um, and see. I represented them visually. For me, it just helped um, having blue as like um, not there, purple as mm -hmm. somewhat there, and red is very much there. Um, and we were able to determine a lot of the arcs. So um, yeah. We had um, like notes on these as well with like clear definitions of what we meant for each tension scale as well, which mm -hmm. like yeah. I came in later and it helped me really adjust to the, the system that Emma created. Yeah. And so we have the themes there too. Um, yeah, I just, I guess I'll go over some of that. Yep. So we had social tension and resource tension. And this one was for um, the game, which is the top chart over there um and then um we were looking at the arc within that so what i found was that there's some tension at the beginning where the story is sort of set up there's some you know kind of medium sort of scenes there's like something to contrast towards that the last mm -hmm. part of that end um the last part of the second third and in the last third it's quite tense it's quite full-on and the the end will have like a level um, which I unfortunately can't tell you much about because it will give away too much of what we're doing. But the end will have some kind of level, some kind of gameplay that um, I want to say some kind of boss fight or something I, like that. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. That. Um, and then the TV show um, was similar in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. We had the characters, as you can see, all marked out. Um, and then this really helped later on because the ones with less characters, we could put in another character and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But um, we found that the um, the arc sort of happens a little sooner and then the cool off period in the last scene that yeah. sort of concludes everything and shows everyone being happy. So something interesting that we had to do here was offset that for the game. So we still had the same arc to keep the, um, the framework and the arc of the story whole, but we mm. put the boss fight um in that second last uh sorry in that last scene um and that would have been the equivalent of the second last scene in the tv show yeah um which is how we sort of manage that because it can be a lot but yeah look for patterns um they, they will be there i know it sounds <laughs> like they won't be because it's a lot of interpreting things um, based on what you think they are but you're probably right because these people mm -hmm. were writing these things that trained in doing that they are trying to put um a perspective out there or a narrative out there that is pretty consistent across the board 
And yes. yeah. All right. So just as a bit of an example, um, went away just before this talk and I did the same sort of thing with um, ABBA's Arrival album. Yeah, we're not, uh, <laughs> disclaimer, we're not working with ABBA. Oh, um, we just thought it was not. a fun example um, of, because you can really analyze anything mm -hmm. and find patterns in anything. So, yeah. So I did it. Um, I came up with, okay, so the three tensions for ABBA, ABBA are usually like their speculation, some sort of dreaming or memory, um, heartbreak, um, and desire for something. Um, and I came up with three themes. It only uh, shows two of them here, but image. So like self-image, making yourself look good, or how you think about yourself relationships and their career. They actually sing about their career quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> um, but you can already see, like, even just with a quick map out of, okay, how do these tensions um, evolve over the course of a song? Like, so, for example, Dancing Queen, you can see, like, okay, yeah, they're remembering, they're dreaming, they've got that speculation. And as soon as that goes away, something comes in to replace it. Yeah, and there's like a almost a build up to one and then a valley and then a dip and it's sort of replaced by something else in the middle. Absolutely. Yeah. And the same sort of thing happened with Money, 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 which had the, the career money yeah. theme, <laughs> theming, obviously. Yeah. Um, so it's just to show you that you really can do it with anything. Yeah. All right. So um, the main points. Oh, um, did we skip one? I think we might have skipped a slide. Oh, no. Um, oh, okay. Um, I think we've skipped over user-friendly data. Something's happened to that, but that's okay. I'll just go over the notes quickly. Um, to make it user-friendly, just uh, make sure that it looks pretty, I guess, because <laughs> a pretty chart is usually one that, um, yeah, a lot of people will go, don't make it pretty. It, it um, saves time and it does save time not to do that. But it also saves people from looking at it and taking it seriously yes. and using it long term. So um, try to keep color blindness in mind as well, if you can, because not everyone can distinguish between some of those colors. Um, those were um, not pretty, not a very good example of that. <laughs> um, but it's something to keep in mind just in case. Mm -hmm. um, so bold headers, clear backgrounds, um, little reports um in a document will really help as well yep. and keeping track of what you've learned so um make sure that you can if someone asks you a question you know exactly where to find that data straight away yep. um and just make sure that anyone who might use that data in your company or the group that you are designing a game with or managing a game just make sure anyone on that team can look at these and know what their takeaways so know which part they have to look at um, which really helps in all documentation but especially for data because mm -hmm. data can be really heavy for and some people like it might feel like a waste of time but I absolutely promise you it's not it, it will, will save, save you. time yeah it will in save the long your run. run yeah absolutely <laughs> um yeah I've had artists thank me <laughs> for the way that I color code things um but it's just I just started doing that because it's the way that makes sense mm -hmm. in my brain because um, I come from an art background too. So creative data use. What if you've joined a, um, a game mid-production or even post-production and it's live, it's out there, mm -hmm. you haven't been able to work with an, analy an analytics team to um, set up some tools to collect data. It can be really hard because a lot of games have um, data that you can see um, to do with levels, but yes. they don't have um, a lot in terms of narrative, but hopefully maybe your stuff that ours definitely <laughs> did not have that. Um, we talked a little bit about setting data up for narrative purposes. Mm -hmm. Now let's take a look at a post-release game. So this is for wildlife. Um, the picture that you saw earlier, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately it's something in front of her now, but that's okay. Um, here's basically the rundown of the data I had and then how I managed to co-opt it into um, doing something for um, re retention for narrative because we had these drop-off points that we had um, for ages. We mm -hmm. changed the levels, but we were still losing players at these specific points. And um, it led the product manager to conclude that it might have something to do with narrative. So we mm -hmm. still weren't entirely happy with how our levels, some of our levels were, and we got a level designer in for that. Um, but then I was set on the task of um, figuring out how to 
get all of these analytics and turn it into something usable for narrative. <laughs> so here we go. I had um, retention per level. Um, so I could see the drop of, of points happening and how many players we were losing. I had how far away from the end of the level they were failing. So whether or not they could um, see the end of the level, whether that was something they could um, conceivably get to mm -hmm. in their minds. Um, how many times a player was restarting the level. So um, was the level fun enough to restart? Did it look like yeah. it was something that they could complete? Um, and the intended difficulty of the level. So really nothing to do with narrative at all. Um, <laughs> it was it was a bit of a thing, but that's okay. And um, the intended difficulty really helped because it was like the harder levels might have a slightly mm -hmm. higher drop off point depending on the level, and that might be more acceptable in some cases. Um, but basically what I did is I looked into, I tracked all of the levels and I came up with all of the associated cutscenes and I um, figured out which ones had the drop off points. And um, then I went through all of the cutscenes that had the drop off points and I um, basically surveyed whether they had any of these problems, whether the players were um, failing too far away from the end of the level or whether they were not restarting the level very much um, to figure out whether it was in fact a narrative problem. So then, then I went through all of the narrative <laughs> um, and tracked out where the points in the story sort of fell I, I don't want to say fell flat, but they didn't have anything interesting or exciting about mm. them. There was no mystery. There was no um, plot twist. <laughs> there was just nothing really there. Or maybe it was just a really short cutscene. We had one that was like just a few sentences long and the decorations for the farm that you get as a re reward. I think like she dug up a log or something. And oh, that okay. was like, oh, all right, we got <laughs> we to do something about this. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> we managed to go through all of those and do a big write-up and plot out um, all of the the beats, uh, the new beats that would happen, and that's how we sort of came up with the framework that we have today that we're mm -hmm. now do using for our pre-production and our production. Um, and, yeah, it's sort of come a long way for me joining uh, very close to a release date and going, oh, my God, this is the analytics I have. There's nothing I can do. <laughs> Here we go. Um, <laughs> But it will happen like that sometimes. Yeah. Um, so what we did to improve that, of course, was we um, put in a lot more decorations. We made the particle effects a lot more punchy and interesting and sparkly and pretty. <laughs> um, and we plotted out what the main themes of the wildlife narrative were, and we spread them out. We made sure if one dipped, another one came and replaced it, um, just like you saw in the ABBA thing. <laughs> um, and yeah, so that's how to sort of study a <laughs> a big piece of media and break it down mm -hmm. into data and then use that data <laughs> to make a game and also how to deal with things when you have just joined a product that's post you being able to really ask for <laughs> anything else that you don't have already um so this is all very new for us at mighty kingdom um when it comes to this stuff it is I who does it. Um, sorry, that's my alarm going off. We're nearly out of time. Um, yeah, so it's basically just been me. And when people ask me to do something for this, they I usually expect them to give me some more direction that I tend to get. Um, but that's what we've come up with. <laughs> and it's lovely to have Rebecca now who cares about this as well. Um, we're figuring it out it together. Is. So maybe now that you have some of our knowledge, you can take that and do some interesting yeah. things with it yourself. And, like, please improve it, please. Please do that. And then Iterate tell us. on it. Oh, yeah. yes, please tell us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>